Welcome back y'all. In this video, I'll be making benzoyl peroxide. I don't need it for any particular reason. I'm making it because benzene ring123 asked me to in the comments on my video of me making benzoyl chloride. This is no coincidence as benzoyl chloride is one of the reagents used to make the peroxide. I still had a decent amount of the chloride left over after using some in my video on the racer reaction, so I figured why not. As it turns out, the synthesis is extremely simple. Benzoyl chloride, hydrogen peroxide, and sodium hydroxide are the only reagents used, and the reaction takes place in an aqueous solution. An, quote, about 10% solution, end quote, of hydrogen peroxide is needed, as well as a 4 molar sodium hydroxide solution. The sodium hydroxide solution and benzoyl chloride are added alternately to the hydrogen peroxide solution, while the temperature is kept between 5 and 8 degrees with an ice bath as the reaction is exothermic. Benzoyl peroxide is sparingly soluble in water, so it continuously precipitates as the acid chloride is added. The low temperature minimizes the hydrolysis of benzoyl chloride and maximizes its reaction with the basic peroxide solution. The procedure I'm using calls for two dropping funnels where the ends of the droppers dip into the peroxide solution. Remember this for later, as instead, for like the first two-thirds of the reaction, I pipe at the sodium hydroxide and benzoyl chloride into it, not submerging the tips, and it causes an issue. The procedure also called for freshly distilled benzoyl chloride because it doesn't keep well and becomes contaminated with hydrolysis products if it's not stored under nitrogen or argon or in an ampule. But I didn't feel like redistilling it because it's cold outside and I'm lazy. The benzoyl chloride I used is about 5-6 to six months old, closer to the latter, and I think this lowers the yield. I'm not all that focused on the yield though, since I don't even have a use for the peroxide. It's mostly used as a source of free radicals in industrial processes, like plastic manufacturing as an initiator in polymerization, as well as an oxidizing agent in bleaching food products like oils and flour, and for what most people would know, for treating acne. If there's something you can think of that you want to see me do with it, let me know in the comments. Here are the amounts of each reagent. I didn't write the molar amounts for any of them, so here they are typed. As you can see, hydrogen peroxide is in the largest excess, probably because some will decompose without participating in the reaction. An excess of sodium hydroxide is used because hydrogen peroxide is much stabler in an alkaline solution than an acidic one, and if none was used, a lot of hydrogen chloride would be produced and decompose the hydrogen peroxide very quickly. I did a rough titration on my 30% peroxide that's 23 years old, and according to the listing, was stored in a lab freezer at like negative 60 degrees until I bought it, and then I stored it in my normal freezer at negative 18 degrees after that. The titration showed it turned out to be roughly 28.7%, which was a very pleasant surprise. Check the description to see the titration method I used. Even though it was cold outside when I did this, I stored the benzoyl chloride in a stopper bottle just in case to minimize its hydrolysis over the course of the reaction. The issue I mentioned earlier that I ran into when it came to adding the reagents is somewhat apparent here. Not submerging the pipettes in the solution when adding them for the first two-thirds of the reaction resulted in the formation of a clump of benzoyl peroxide and made the magnetic stirring stall a bunch. For the last third of the reaction, I did submerge the pipettes into the solution when adding the reagents, which of course didn't break up the existing clump, but did prevent it from getting bigger. And the benzoyl peroxide that precipitated was in small flocks, and once I broke up the clump with the thermometer, the magnetic stirring became more consistent. Not perfect, but it was better than it was. After the additions were complete, I still wasn't happy with how clumpy the precipitate was, so I got my massive mortar and pestle out to grind it down to a hopefully 100% consistently magnetically stirrable solution. This worked. I stirred the mixture for about 30 additional minutes to get any remaining benzoyl chloride to react, and then moved on to filtration. I washed the product twice with about 100 milliliters of distilled water each time to remove any soluble impurities. Here's the crude product. It turned out to be 30.70 grams dry, 
but its melting point was low and over a large range, somewhere between 85 and 95 degrees, so it was impure enough that I didn't feel like calculating a yield would matter. The procedure I used said the yield would be between 30 and 36 grams for the amounts that I used, but it doesn't say if that's before or after purification. The procedure gives two methods to purify it. One is a traditional recrystallization for small amounts from boiling ethanol, but what I have is not a small amount, so I didn't do that. The other method is dissolving the peroxide in as little chloroform as possible at room temperature, then diluting the solution with twice as much methanol by volume to precipitate it. I didn't want to use any of my chloroform though, since I have to make it myself. It's super expensive to ship and not worth buying in that way. So I checked one of my favorite chemistry-related books, Purification of Laboratory Chemicals. A similar method of purification outlined in this book is to dissolve the peroxide in as little acetone as possible at room temperature, then dilute the solution with twice as much distilled water by volume. And that's what I did. My acetone was out in the cold, so I warmed it up to about 25 degrees to dissolve all of the peroxide. Approximately 210 milliliters was needed to fully dissolve it, and then when I realized the beaker I used was too small, I didn't actually expect to use the full amount that I poured in the smaller beaker. I transferred everything to a bigger one and washed the smaller one out with a little acetone, so it probably ended up being about 230 milliliters. I diluted it with approximately 475 milliliters of distilled water, and then continued stirring for a few minutes, and I went on to filter it. I washed the product with 100 milliliters of distilled water, and let it dry on the pump for a few hours. In that time, more benzoyl peroxide precipitated in the filtrate, but I just didn't think it was worth recovering. Here it is before completely dry, 26 grams of the damp product. In these clips, I test one of the more notable properties of benzoyl peroxide, which is its explosivity. Since it's a peroxide, peroxides are notoriously unstable, especially these kinds of organic peroxides. There's another one that's similarly used in the plastics industry, which is the peroxide derivative of methyl ethyl ketone, or 2-butanone, which is a very commonly available uh, paint stripper. But benzoyl peroxide is a bit safer and less sensitive to shock and, to some extent, temperature. In these clips, I used at least half a gram probably a little more, and what I had after the product completely dried and after what I used in these clips was 21.69 grams. So I'll say I ended up with 22 grams. It was probably closer to 23, but oh well. I used 22 grams to calculate the yield, which was 56.74%. Of benzoyl peroxide with a melting point of 105 to 107 degrees, which is very close to the literature melting point of 103 to 106 degrees. The yield isn't good, but it's quite pure, and again, I don't have any use for it at the moment, so yield wasn't really a priority for me in the first place. I think the yield would have been higher if I freshly distilled the benzoyl peroxide. I don't know if submerging the pipettes in the peroxide solution when adding the reagents would have increased the yield, but it definitely would have helped lessen the clumping of the precipitate, and with the magnetic stirring. In these clips, I'm putting small amounts of benzoyl peroxide on foil, and then hitting them with the torch. First two ones, I don't fold them up in the foil. I just leave them open, and you can see what happens, of course. For the last flame test, I wrapped up quite a bit of it in two layers of aluminum foil, and it was pretty loud, and I was happy with the results, so I stopped after that. The last one just popped a hole straight through the aluminum foil, which was a good sign. And that's about all I've got. Thank you for watching. If you want to, like, comment, and or subscribe. I would really appreciate it. it. helps me out. And I will see you in the next video.